Science connects the complexity of life. From the basic building blocks at a microscopic level to massively interacting populations. It guides public policy. It addresses the pressing challenges to human health, habitat, and well-being. The biocomplexity approach encompasses multiple disciplines, experiential learning, and looks at science as it exists and interacts in the world. Science connects researchers, highlights collaborations, and helps solve issues that face our lives today. Well, hello everyone. I'm Becky Freemall with the Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech. And with me is Carla Finkelstein. She is a researcher and scientist at the Institute, actually just a few doors down from me. Very good. <laughs> um, first of all, welcome, Carla. Thank you very much. Thanks um, for having me. First question for you is just a little bit about your background. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to the Biocomplexity Institute. Okay. I'm a biologist. My background is in molecular biology, and um, I'm very much interested in understanding how processes that happen at large scale take place and all the variables that actually control some behaviors and some physiological processes, and that imply, implies um, really big data analysis and also implies um, a larger scale of, of, of knowledge integrated in just one single cell. And the Biocomplexity Institute seems to fill that gap very nicely. So we can do our experimental work and at the same time team up with specialists that know how to do all this big data processing and help us to predict some behavioral processes that we can actually test again in the lab. It seems like science is really going toward that kind of biocomplexity approach, and maybe it always was, and we're just now figuring it out. It has been like that since the whole genome project was really um, solved and established, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, once that was done, and we knew that we have a bunch of ACTGs all over the place, but they <laughs> actually make sense when they are put it all together, then really the whole process of bioinformatics and analyzing big data came to play. And, and I think after that, it was all about, you know, crossing disciplines. Nowadays, it's all analyzing what happened at a larger scale. So I think that's one of the beauties of being at the, at the Institute is, we, you know, we, we bring the very much of the experimental aspect that is much needed to understand some diseases. But on the other side, we have how can we just translate that in, in, in a larger context, you know, in a larger analysis on, on what happened at the population level, how this would affect too many cells, not just one cell, how this would affect behavior. So in that, that aspect, our partnership works very well. Does that seem to be growing? And, and I honestly don't know the answer to this, but that whole that holistic approach, um, and maybe it's because I work at the Biocomplexity Institute and I'm surrounded by it every day, but is that really the way all scientists, all researchers look at, you know, your corner of the world and how it affects the bigger system? Um, you know, as, as scientists, you, you will always find both sides, right? Yeah. I mean, there are the, the, the very reductionist approach where scientists, they just look at how things work in a very microscopic environment. But the reality is that we always try to extrapolate that. You might not do it now, you might do it in the future, or your, or your research might be the seed for future research. But ev eventually, I think that's the direction we are moving on. And... Um, and you see that it has been tremendously successful in very many aspects, you know, nowadays by having the um, genome of very, very, very many tumors, we can predict, for example, what kind of chemical or chemotherapeutic ar approach will be the best for a specific patients. So understanding that upper level scale of complexity is tremendously important for what we do as researchers, even if we focus initially in one cell. Makes sense? Yes, it does. It makes it makes perfectly good sense. And I think it's so interesting for me as a communicator and a non-scientist to show up at the Biocomplexity Institute and absorb this over the past year and a half. And it makes perfectly good sense to me. And I think, well, does anyone do it any other way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has been done like that for a really long time. But I mean, science evolves, right? And, and now with all these technological advan advances, what we are doing is basically taking advantage of that. You know, we scientists, we've been taking advantage of everything that physicists and computational scientists have done. Um, we just simply apply that technology to a biological problem. 
Um, you know, we talked today about personalized medicine, right? Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't talk about that 20 years ago. I mean, before the first genome project was completed. Nowadays, we say, okay, well, we are going to sequence the cells in the tumor. We are going to um, put this in a database. We're going to find out among all the other tumors that they were sequenced and treated with drugs, which one, which kind of drugs will work for this patient. If this patient has the same mutations or modifications in the DNA that this other set of patients had and for which the drugs work. Okay, I mean, if you really think we are really moving in that direction, we have already done that and, and, and it's working. Okay, that's, that's the beauty. I mean, it's, you know, we needed to start small because we needed, we needed to understand the basic biological problems for which those therapeutics will work. But that doesn't mean that we need to stay there forever. And doesn't mean that we cannot come back to that approach, reductionist approach, when we need it. I mean, I see this as a, you know, two ways uh, road. I mean, we, we go back and then we feed, uh, you know, we feed the databases with tons of data. We collect more data from the patients and then we go back to the cells and study how those chemotherapeutic drugs work. I mean, sorry that I go back and forth only with the example of cancer. This applies to very many other diseases. It's just simply because cancer is my expertise. You know, that's one of the beauties. It's not unidirectional. And I want to kind of go toward your expertise. But before we get to your cancer research, um, back it up a little bit and explain um, the circadian rhythms and the research you do with circadian rhythms, because I know that's eventually going to tie into Yeah, cancer. my whole life I would be interested, I, I, I've been interested in, in understanding how cells divide. You know, since I was like eight years old, I mean, it was very plain clear for me. One of those kids that never hesitate on what they want to do when they grow up. I want to understand how a cell divides. And the reason for that is because at that time, the dogma was that cancer was uh, a disease of uncontrolled cell division. We know now that it's a little bit more complicated than that, and you, put, you can put it in a different context. But nevertheless, that's always what I want to study. And, and that's what I did. I really studied my whole life cell division until I found out that there is a component that we were missing in the angle of cell division. And I found very interesting that the cells divide at a specific times of the day. Like, for example, your cells now are all replicating DNA. You like, you like it, you don't like it, Becky. Your cells are replicating DNA. It's happening now. It's happening now, and you have no control <laughs> about that. Okay, so there's a total disaster for you, something that you don't have control about, right? <laughs> so around 4 or 5 p.m. today, your cells are going to stop division. They're going to, uh, sorry, stop replication. They finish replicating the DNA, and they're going to enter in a period that is called G2 in the, in the jargon. And that has to do with checking that everything that was done in the, during the day, the whole replication process was done right, meaning that all your DNA has been replicated and there has, done, there has been no mistake. Oh, now. It's like a they, business. It's, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> the copy editors at the end of the day. Exactly. <laughs> so now, let's say, if, if that machine finds that there has been a mistake and it cannot be repaired, it's going to trigger a mechanism that is going to lead to cell death. So the cell, before committing to division, okay, chooses to die instead of passing something that is wrong to the daughter cell. Okay. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's amazing. It's a, it's, it's a very altruist mechanism. It's but, impressive. Uh, but it's, it's the way that it works. And the, the cell has no brain inside, okay? But if that mechanism says, okay, Becky's DNA has been copied perfectly okay, there has been no mistake, everything is completed, then your cells commit to division. And commit to division around 10 p.m., okay? So 10 p.m. to 9, no glass of wine because your cells are dividing, okay? From 10 to 11, your cells divide. At 11 p.m., your cells finish division and they rest for several hours. So 10 to 11 is like the hour that you be better be as healthy as possible and <laughs> it's be okay. drinking water and sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> no, really, you don't need to go to that level. But because like I said, this is a process that you cannot really control in any way, right? right. But once it happens, your, soul are gonna, your cells are going to accumulate nutrients and, are gonna, and they're going to grow. And that's what is going to happen while you're sleeping, basically. And then early in the morning, their cells begin a new round of replication, okay? 
So what really puzzled me as a researcher interested in cell cycle is this time problem. How do these cells know what time, what time of the day is? <laughs> okay, I mean, my, my friends always say that I, I talk about cells like if they have little brains. Right. But they don't, they don't really have little brains, but they have to have something to realize that there is, you know, that is 10 p.m. outside. It's time right? to do my job. So, so when I finished my studies in cell cycle regulation and I, I, I felt like I had a very good grasp of the topic, I decided that in my lab I want to add that additional angle, which is the time angle. Okay, so how can we how can we um, merge the uh, dimensional angle of time in this cell division process? How right. can we combine these two things? And the first thing that came to my mind was all these issues related with circadian rhythm. And at that time, there were not very many molecular bases. It was very hard to convince, you know, uh, people in the job market. <laughs> that what I was trying to do of finding the molecular basis of how cells divide at one specific time was first a sexy idea, and second, it makes sense. <laughs> right. Um, so fortunately, in that sense, tech was very welcoming and, and gave me the opportunity to try to do this kind of research. And what we did is, is hypothesize that every cell has a little clock inside. And it's really this connection and, and the clock inside the cell and the environment that somehow that dictates when the cell should divide. So the question is, can we find the clock inside the cell? And by then, there has been a lot of work done in circadian rhythm in other organisms. Okay, um, the work um, done by um, the Nobel Prize winners from last year, Jeffrey Hall, Michael Rochebert, and Michael Young, um, where they really describe the core mechanism of the clock, which is a bunch of molecules. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't matter the name. And these molecules, what, what was particularly interesting to me about these molecules is that these molecules, they, um, they are present as a, as a core part of the clock in organisms that go from algaes and bacteria to fungi to flies to humans. Hmm. So you see ac across the whole spectrum. They all have it. All have it, okay? In your case, might be 10 of which six are core, okay? And fungi are six or seven of which three or four are a core. But this this minimum core of molecules are consistent across a species, okay? So then, you know, for a molecular biologist like me, it's all about what are these molecules doing, right? <laughs> right. Okay, for I want to know, and I'm not a scientist, <laughs> do tell. So, <laughs> so these molecules control the expression of genes. And from the moment that these, con these molecules control the expression of genes, there was a potential link. So what we're doing in the lab is really to understand how is that changes in these molecules, levels, and expression, which is what are the basics for moving a clock forward, okay, influence the expression of genes involved in cell division. And what we found is that it happens. You know, when certain molecules that control the clock are awake, molecules involved in dividing the cell are awake. Hmm. Okay, and when these guys turn off, these guys turn off, and sometimes happen the opposite. So, so that is the initial con connection that we found. I think the, the most interesting aspect of our research is the fact that now we know that some of those core mo clock molecules control tumor suppressors, which are the molecules that usually put the brakes in division. And if you don't put the brake in division, then the cell keeps dividing in an uncontrolled way. So the fact that clock molecules control the expression of tumor suppressors is, is really remarkable. So, my Okay, I'm not objective because it's my research. Right, right, but we all think it's spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think when I hear you talking about this and circadian rhythms and how it sounds like it is very important um, into this greater research of cancer um, and into and, and, and your health in general, I think about my past life when I was a broadcast journalist and working crazy hours. I think about some of my friends who are MDs and are working overnight shifts or nurses. Um, how does this affect 
your health when does yeah. it, like can you change your circadian rhythm to work with your adjust with your yeah, schedule the, fortunately the circadian rhythm experts which is not my case but this this group of scientists they have done tremendously good job at the physiological level and epidemiological level um, understanding how disruption of your circadian ry rhythm which is exactly what you described affects health yeah and um, um, we know nowadays that disruption of your circadian rhythm is related to obesity, for example, to behavioral processes, uh, pro uh, problems, is related to, um, for example, um, a sleep dysfunction, okay? We know that it's related to cancer. And in particular, in the field of cancer, we know that, for example, women that work night shifts, they have a higher propensity to develop breast cancer. 37%. Oh, wow. It's, it's pretty high. This comes from epidemiological studies, doing in nurses, flight attendants, even telegraphers in, in the early ages of telegraphers, um, the medical field, especially. Um, some um, women, women in factories, some of them were disregarded at the beginning because they were like, well, you know, um, these women work on factories, but they are exposed to chemicals. Maybe it's a problem with the chemicals. Oh, okay. Or fly attendants. They are exposed to radiation because they they fly in this big uh, um, aircraft. Or, or nurses that are exposed to stress. But nowadays we see this consistency. And you see that in Western societies this way. Western societies have, have way much more incidence of breast cancer in the case of breast cancer than many other societies and, and has been linked epidemiologically to these abnormal circadian rhythms that we are forcing our body to get into. Because you like it, you don't like it, your body is set for you waking up with the, sun, uh, sun, the sunrise and going to sleep at, at very late in the afternoon at sundown. Yeah, like sundown. in the evening. Or in the evening. But you basically are changing that, okay? Uh, yeah. I mean, the moment that you uh, stay awake late, mm -hmm. okay, because you're reading or because you're exposed to light, artificial light, you're causing something that my colleagues call social jet lag, which is basically you are, you are creating an artificial jet lag in your body. Uh. And that art artificial jet lag it really mess with your physiology. Interesting. Um, and that propagates in your body because your circadian rhythm is endogenous. What does it mean? It means that in th more or less you will go to sleep and wake up every day, even if I put you in a completely dark environment for a month. Whether okay? you see the light or not, your body just does exactly. it. Exactly. I mean, that is, that is a property of the circadian rhythm, okay? It's built in, basically. Um, and this has been, these are experiments that actually have been done with graduate students. Um, well, they needed money to pay for tuition. Again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, where, you know, students were monitored over time with no light input and, you know, were recorded, you know, it's when is that they wake up and they go to sleep. And the same thing were done with Rollins. Um, so what happened is that light basically entrains you, basically synchronizes you to the day, mm -hmm. okay? but your rhythm is endogenous. Now, when you work night shift, you're exposed to artificial light. So now your body thinks that you should be sleeping, resting, but no, you're getting a signal that is light all the time, and that light influences your melatonin release and suppresses melatonin release, and now you have no release of melatonin, you stay awake, okay, for longer hours, and now your ovaries, they don't produce estradiol, Okay, and suddenly your peak of hormone that is circadian um, now gets shifted. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you're we are responsible for what is happening to our bodies, to our bodies. Yeah. And or our bosses who make us work overnight, but you, know, <laughs> you got to pay the bills. Yeah, I guess so. Um, well, I mean, I don't know, but uh, if if you know, but uh, most of the um, companies, the computer companies now, they are making kind of this. Um, um, protecting systems, light protecting systems, so that it doesn't influence our um, oh, cool. behavior so much because they change the, the wavelength of light and everything that we are exposed to. 
So here's a question that might just be like, I don't know, your entire life's work is the answer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But when you say that, it sounds as though, obviously, there is this link between circadian rhythm and cancer. But what what is that link? Or are you still trying to figure that out over the next 20 years? I think, (laughs) well, no, I I think there are a number of, of very good studies done by a number of groups, with our group being one of them, that have found this connection between circadian molecules and cell cycle molecules that when the circadian molecules are deregulated because they are not expressed at the right time because you are exposed to a shift work, for example, then these other molecules that control division are deregulated as well. Now, of course, in the case of tumors, um, the reality is that tumor is... um, you know, a cancer is a genetic disease. You still need mutations for things to happen. Okay, um, so uh, so I, I think it's a, a collection of problems. I don't think we have a clear, full understanding exactly of everything that is going on there. I think we are in a good path to understand how all these molecules connect. Um, I think my colleagues and myself are really very proactive in understanding all this at the molecular level. Um, I think we have done a tremendous work in the last 10 years. Um, we don't have the answers, but there are a couple of things that we do know that can help cancer patients, for example. We do know that certain circadian molecules interact with certain um, other molecules in the cell at a specific times of the day. And because of that, this second group of molecules, they are not working, okay, or, or they are in some cases. So we can exploit that therapeutically. So what we can say is that, okay, if your drug is given to a patient to um, target a molecule or a process that happens at a specific time of the day, then what we need to do is make sure that the therapeutic is given timely. Right. Okay. That is something that we don't do these days. Okay. For example, if your DNA replicates during the, during the day, You don't want to give a drug that targets DNA replication at night. Because it's not happening. Because it's not happening, okay? And and I understand why sometimes it's given at night. It's because you want to avoid the side effects on the patient. Oh. Okay? So you want the patient to take the medication and go to sleep, okay? And then doesn't sleep very well anyway, but, you know, it's... It's kind of you're taking advantage of a natural process to reduce the side effects of the drug. However, what happens is by the time the patient wakes up, okay, probably half of the drug or more is out of the body. It disappears. It has been metabolized. It has been broken down. Mm -hmm. So when the process that this drug is supposed to target is happening, then you don't have the right amount of that drug to be therapeutically efficient. So where's the situation? The situation is you give more drug to the patient. Then the side effects are greater. So we kind of, in the field of chronobiology, we kind of advocate for either timely delivery of the drugs. We, we think that that will, will actually help to reduce the side effects of the drugs and at the same time be more effective. Maybe by giving the drug at a specific time, you don't need to give such a high dose. The quality of life of a patient is better and the effectiveness is better. It's not an easy task, um, especially for processes that have to happen at the hospital. Right. We're, we're not talking about taking a pill, you know. Right, right. <laughs> we're talking about, you know, chemotherapeutic drugs, radiation therapy, things like this. And and if the, if the conclusion is that in order to get the maximum effectiveness, you need to deliver, let's say, as an example, radiation therapy, two in the morning, just an example. Right. How are you going to get that done? Yeah. How are you <laughs> going to get that done? And what guarantees that the person that is at the liver is going to deliver the radiation therapy is at the peak of alertness at two in the morning to do it right. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's a lot of, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very complex process. Right. I mean, my, my goal is to end up telling the clinicians for this particular treatment, this is the best timeline. Right. Okay. And I assume that from there, they will take it. But we need to advocate, for example, for more um, clinical trials that include circadian uh, studies. 
Okay. Uh, there's a champion on this, which is Francis Levy. Um, he is now working in UK, um, and he has done tremendous work with patient, not just Robbins, showing that there is an there is really a good um, um, good result in really good results in in applying therapeutics at the specific times of the day. Don't take me wrong. I'm not saying that this is going to cure, okay, a patient. What I'm saying that this might improve the efficacy of the drugs, okay? This will definitely improve the quality of life of a patient, which is not trivial, okay? And I think it might even help to repurpose drugs. You know, maybe maybe drugs were taken out of the market or something because, well, they don't work. Well, maybe they don't work because the target for that drug, which happened to be in a cell when you have a Petri dish, is there, but in the tumor, in the body, it's not. And the other thing that could happen is that we can take advantage that the clocks of the tumor cells are usually different from the clock of the rest of the body. Oh, really? Yeah. So then that could be a therapeutic advantage. Maybe what we can do is to take advantage that these cells are doing something when the other ones are not. So if you deliver a drug at this time, even if it's not targeted therapy, okay, mm -hmm. even if it's a systemic therapy, meaning that it goes through all the body, still it will only target a process that is happening in tumor cells. So it'll leave your other healthy cells alone. Yeah. So I think we need to exploit that angle more. I, yes. I think, I, I do believe in personal personalized therapy. I think it's a great thing. But if we add this additional dimension of time, I will nail it. This is super exciting. And I'm thinking about all the things that could be. But then I think about that patient who might be listening now and doesn't have that 20 years to wait for that research to happen. Um, as a patient, as a breast cancer patient or any cancer patient or anyone dealing with any health issues, how do you advocate for yourself? And, and I will go back to breast cancer since that's what you really do a lot of work with. Um, talk about this. I mean, maybe like screening. It seems like there can be something in our grasp because I want to I want to have control of my health. And right now I feel like I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, Becky, <laughs> I, mean, I, I can do about yes, it. Right? But I mean, I hear everything you're saying and it's so exciting and I think that's awesome. But it's 20 years, 30 years away. What Hopefully can I do not. Right now? Hopefully not. I want to see that working before you know. I hope so. Before I'm gone, right? Okay. From you know, I'm not a clinician, so I cannot go that far on that application. Yes. Um, all what I do is I try to advocate for for these things to happen as fast as possible. I try to educate clinicians and the public about the importance of these issues because I think it's at the end it's all about us trying to move the things forward. Right. from the professional aspect and from the personal aspect. Um, I think um, nowadays uh, people is more aware of these problems related with um, shift work and there has been certain modifications on, in terms of regulation of how shift work is, is applied these days. That helps a lot. For example, fly attendance. In the past, being fly attendant was super cool because, you know, you have one of these inter international flights and you stay in the in the country where you arrive and stay there one day per every hour of, of jet lag, let's say, that you will have, right? Uh, so you go to Madrid and you stay there six extra days in Madrid, all pay in a hotel and everything, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I want to believe that. Um, and then return home, okay? And, and, and that was the original strategy. And that is a total disaster for your circadian rhythm. I mean, the initial concept is you go there, you get adjusted to the circadian rhythm there, and then you return. That is even worse than going there and come back. Really? It's way much worse because it takes a week roughly for, I mean, it takes a couple of days for you to adjust to the light dark cycle. Mm -hmm. And it takes a week at least for your other clocks in the body, the ones that are in your liver, intestines, stomachs, everything, to adjust to the new circadian rhythm. So by the time that these people were adjusting okay to that new rhythm, they were coming back and readjusting to their home rhythm. It was a total disaster. So nowadays, and the flight attendants, they arrive, for example, in Madrid in the morning and then fly back to their home base at night. I'm pretty sure that they don't like that and it's tremendously stressful. But from the circadian rhythm standpoint, it's the best thing that could happen to them because they don't get disrupted twice. 
same thing when you fly to Europe. Don't 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 get your dinner. Skip the dinner and get your breakfast, and that will help you to synchronize your body much faster. Oh, really? Too bad, but I know. Interesting. <laughs> Especially if you're steak flying and, in business. Yeah, right. Exactly. I'll take a steak and wine for breakfast, please. Um, um, okay, from the breast cancer standpoint, yeah. the things that we need to do are, are very simple. The first thing that we need to know is is we need to learn about our breast. We need to do... Um, what is called breast ex self-examination. You need to know what is normal for you, okay? So each breast is different, and and women, they need to know what is normal for their breast. So self-examination with your ha hand is the best way to go. You need to get your mammogram done every year, okay? I know the million excuses. You can give me a list of excuses. I have, I, I have heard all of them, okay? Okay, get over. You need to get it done. I mean, it's, today is the is the best screening method that we have. Doesn't mean that we are not going to have better in the future, but today is the best thing that we have. Um, the reality is, breast cancer is a disease that takes several years to develop, six, seven years to develop. So the chances of getting it detected early on makes a huge difference in terms of survival. If it's detected early, you get ninety percent survival. So, yes, it's not fun to get a squish. And your breast, definitely there is nothing I can tell you that will make it sound good. Other than just deal with it. But do it. <laughs> Period. Well, and you were saying, you know, you're a researcher, not a clinician, but you do a lot of work with trying to get mammography screening, and I think even in, in some of the more rural areas, yeah. correct? Talk a I, little bit about that. I, I think it's because one thing that I found about Montgomery County, and one of the reasons because I like the area, is it's such a beautiful area, such a... You get an idea that it's a very healthy environment, right? Um, and I like that. And I was really astonished when I learned that uh, one of the highest instances of breast cancer happened in this county, in this county and in Roanoke County. And I was like, wait, hold on a second. That's not possible. I mean, we don't have these huge factories. We don't have all this spill of chemicals. And how is that possible? And then... I tied up with two really great organizations, the Virginia Breast Cancer Foundation and the Common Blue Ridge Affiliate. And we did a lot of work on rural areas in terms of studying why is that we have this high incidence of breast cancer. And the conclusion was astonishing in the sense that it was all about education, I mean, or resources, or access to resources. They either, people was not aware of, of their need for do mammographies every year, or the clinician didn't encourage um, the patient to do that, or they didn't even go to the clinician, or they didn't have an access or a facility close by where to do it, or they didn't have a car to go there. So we've been very proactive in bringing those resources to those rural areas to make sure that women, they get a screen mm -hmm. and they get a report. And of course, there were issues associated with insurance, and and we need to educate them as well about their possibilities for insurance because there are multiple programs that they can take advantage of, and they were simply unaware of that. So, um, so we have a we have a goal of reducing um, breast cancer by fifty percent in the next two years, just in the in few counties. We started this program several years ago. We we'll see how it goes when we when we survey the areas again. Uh, but really, I mean, we have done a lot of educational work. And, and as you can imagine, imagine myself going to someone's door, knocking the door and say, I'm here to talk about mammography and breast cancer. And they look at me like, oh, she doesn't have anything better to do on Saturday. <laughs> 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 or... <laughs> or she doesn't sound from southwestern Virginia. She doesn't you know? have that twang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I always have a partner or someone that comes with me. But So I, I just play the sci scientist role. Uh, but, but the reality is that once we explain it, it makes sense. But still we need to figure out a way to, to solve the issues related with transportation and care and everything. And, and there is where these two organizations really come on board and, and help to propagate this. Um, and I really love doing it, and I'll keep doing it. And sometimes I go to events, nobody really cares about breast cancer. I'm there, and you know, if someone cares, I ask. And I also try to educate a lot of men. 
Um, not only because men can also um, develop breast cancer, although to a much lesser extent, but also because they are the caregivers mm -hmm. in very many cases. And there's a huge relevance on the caregiver of the disease. You know, it's like women need to have someone that is a partner that understands the problems and, and the things that will happen as a result of this disease. And also it's very good if the caregiver is the one that tells the woman, you need to go and get your mammogram done. They that listen. Is, yeah. So all these are things that you know, come as something that we need to do. I, I, I'm a scientist that believes that as a scientist, I have a social responsibility. You know, I'm a still a very idealistic scientist. Um, <laughs> so I, I take this as part of my responsibility as a scientist that is living in a society and for me to deliver my science to someone that will actually take advantage. Of. So I want to kind of wrap it all up with something we were talking about earlier, and I thought this was interesting, that you say you have, you know, that our life, li our lifespan isn't that long. You have to get things done when you're here, and as a productive scientist, it's even shorter. Mm -hmm. And that you came to the United States because you thought you could be the most productive here. Um, my vote is you have been very productive, but how do you feel, and, and, and how do you feel in the next 10 to 20 years? I assume we're, we're going to squeeze at least 20 more years out of you, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not worried. I'm leaving a, a crew of really good scientists behind me. My students are fantastic. Um, so, you know, my role, like it was the role of my supervisors, um, doesn't end with me. I mean, we need to understand that this is a process. Mm -hmm. And my job is do good science, um, enjoy passing the bottom to, to the new generation, make sure that these guys are ready for what is coming. Hopefully, uh, they, will, they, they will not need to work in cancer. They can work in something else because cancer will be done by the time that I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I think that's how things continue. It's, it's not w one person career. I mean, it's, there are very few examples in science where this is, was all about one person. Um, so I think it's very important to train the next generation of scientists to make to, to be sure that they are up to the speed on, on what is needed, what is lacking in science, um, to help them to be very creative, um, to um, be passionate about what they are looking for, um, love training, um, um, love knowledge, and and I think those guys are going to be the ones that maybe put the cherry on top and finish this problem. Um, so I, I'm one more person in the whole chain. Well, I think passion is contagious. And I think if they are your students, they will have it. I like have this desire now to go to a computer and like search everything about circadian rhythms <laughs> and learn everything I can because it's absolutely amazing. Um, and I think that's a whole different conversation to talk to you about your students and the generations to come. And, and I think we should should have that conversation at some point so okay well thanks a lot thank you carla for coming and thanks again for having me. absolutely and like i said we're going to have you back i have no doubt <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and again i'm becky freemall with the biocomplexity institute thank you for joining us and listening to this amazing research by carla finkelstein and uh without a doubt we'll hear more thank you very much sharing knowledge accelerates discovery to learn about other transdisciplinary collaborations go to bi.vt.edu. The Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech revolutionizes information biology, personalizes healthcare, and develops new tools to accelerate the pace of scientific discovery.